Welcome to the Geotape and FICO Low Dimensional Topology Seminar. Today we have Radmila Sazdanovic, who's going to talk about a landscape of knots, TDA and dimension reduction techniques. Take it away, Radmila. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to, to be giving a talk today, uh, and I hope um, you'll enjoy the topic. <laughs> so, um, Again, the title is uh, maybe somewhat mysterious, maybe not. Uh, it's a landscape of knots, topological data analysis, and dimension reduction techniques in theoretical mathematics. And of course, the subtext here is that um, theoretical mathematics here really refers to um, low dimensional topology and knot theory. Hence, I guess the low dimensional topology seminar affiliation is, is appropriate, I hope. So, um, um, what's the, here's the overview for you um, all. Um, there's going to be uh, kind of two major approaches that I'm going to introduce um, in the beginning, um, and then I'm going to show you the results um, that are still uh, very preliminary. So the idea, um, the idea is that my background is in low dimensional topology and, and much of my research too, but that I've um, learned about a wonderful area called topological data analysis. Um, um, at the University of Pennsylvania, and that it seemed to me that um, those two um, can live in uh, symbiosis and, and, and uh, be used together um, to the benefit of, um, of, of um, topology, right? So, so uh, basically the idea is that there's this big data analysis tool like machine learning, manifold learning, dimension reduction, and so on and so on. And then uh, we also do have um, now a lot of data in knot theory. Um, and I want to sort of briefly discuss what, um, what makes uh, knot theory data um, kind of amenable to these, uh, to these techniques. Uh, but all of the problems that we're going to focus in knot theory actually fit into, within the framework of infinite data set that is hard to sample. So, for example, why, is, uh, why are knots hard to sample? Well, because we know, for example, one, one reason why is that um, um, alternating knots are overrepresented for lower cost crossing numbers. But again, the idea then would be to, to kind of uh, create a hybrid approach that I'm going to uh, call in this talk persistent PCA, where we're going to blend um, uh, an idea from topological data analysis or filtration and, and then the principal component analysis. But then again, that brings us back to, to the even kind of earlier question, which is, well, knots are shapes, knots are, um, you know, circles embedded in, in R3. And when I say knots, I really mean knots or links. It doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, the idea is, well, what do we do? How can we um, vectorize this data? Or how can we um, make a computer understand or read knots easier? Um, and in particular, we know that, um, again, most of the time, the way we are working with knots is, is actually by looking at their projections, at knot diagrams, which, again, it's a, it's a natural thing to do because, you know, we have paper is two-dimensional and computer screens are two-dimensional, but we are losing information when we do that. And uh, we are also gaining a lot of redundancy because one knot has infinitely many. Um, diagrams, so what do we do with them? So the idea was to actually uh, turn knots into vectors, um, and again, that's, that's um, like a more general idea, which would sort of turn any shape into, into some vector that will contain um, numerical values, numerical descriptors. And then, of course, in knot theory, we have a bunch of numerical invariants that can be used in that way. Um, and in particular, in this talk, we're going to um, be um, using vectors that are obtained from um, various knot polynomials. Okay, so I hope that that sort of like this blend of um, a more general idea and the application to knot theory um, is appealing to you um, because we're going to be focusing on those um, to the rest of the talk. Of course, um, if we're talking about the general question, the goal would be to improve the recognition or identification and, of course, the circumventing the, the problems with, that come from um, computational complexity of these shape descriptors. 
And of course, in, in knot theory, we know that, you know, we have beautiful knot invariants um, that are, um, have very high computational complexity or they're MP hard, or, um, you know, if it's a group, then, you know, comparing groups is MP hard. So um, in this in this thing we're going in this talk we're going to uh, touch on the on the on the um, question of character oh, sorry of, on classifying knots uh, because you know that's what knots knot invariants are invented for but our main focus will actually be in comparing knot invariants and sort of characterizing their their discriminative discriminative power so what I mean by that is sort of like doing that doing so in um, in a more global way, in, in a more, if you wish, or it's, it's, it's used very loosely in, in a statistical way, rather on a um, case by case basis, and then maybe providing evidence for um, existing conjectures or, or maybe coming up with some new ones. Um, any questions? Okay, by the way, so feel free to um, interrupt at any point. Okay, so um, what I promised you is that I'm going to uh, work with like two um, different approaches. And again, one approach is a hybrid approach between a principal component analysis and um, the idea of filtration coming from uh, topological data analysis. That's um, what persistent homology is based on. So this is my slide, a, a very, very brief one. The, just to sort of remind you, the principal component analysis or PCA is an orthogonal linear transformation that sort of provides you with a new basis. Um, and that sort of basis um, gives you um, a so-called principal direction. Uh, and, and it basically ranks this direction based on maximal variance. So the first um, direction sort of is, is the direction in which there's the most variance in your data. Um, so, you know, if you look at this little picture, there's more variance in the X prime. You know, we start with a coordinate system X and Y, and we come up with X prime, Y prime, and you can kind of see that X prime is the first principal component because there's more variance in that direction than in the second direction. Uh, the next uh, quantity that, you know, comes with, with this approach is, of course, the eigenvalue, lambda I, where lambda I is sort of associated with the I direction, and that's the explained uh, variance associated with this corresponding eigenvector and it basically tells us how, how much variance there is. And, um, and if, if you want to sort of just have like an intuitive um, understanding of what the PCA does, it sort of it describes the dimension of your data set, the intrinsic dimension of a data set. Sort of it says, well, you know, maybe your data set had a lot of noise or something, but, you know, if there's like five principal uh, components, then then you sort of say, well, it's it's really intrinsically five dimensional, although it appeared to be much higher dimensional. Okay, so this is if we're applying uh, PCA once, okay. Uh, but again, the idea here uh, is that uh, ultimately uh, we would love to use the existing computations, the existing data sets, to make some um, um, conclusions or sort of to make. Um, guesses or or um, or conjectures about what's what's true in general so um, it would be very good to to sort of um, be able to extrapolate the conclusions that we can make based on the existing data sets to maybe data sets that you know we'll have in the future or to to all all nots so what we're going to do, we're going to apply a PCA to a collection of next nested spaces. And again, this is informal, but I refer to it here as a persistent PCA. So when can you do that? Um, well, you can do it as long as you have some um, well-ordering index set on your data. Um, so you know, if you have a partially ordered set, or if you have, let's say, some sort of Morse function, um, then you can you can uh, create a nested sequences of data out of your data set, and um, and then you can apply principal component analysis to each um, element of your sequence um, of this nested sequence, and and what that will provide you with is the insight of how these eigenvectors and and uh, explained variances change across your filtration. Um, so what will they tell you is, is how your how they change um, with with the when you're growing your your point cloud. Okay, so 
um, this is sort of what the first approach does. And, and I'm going to show you um, um, a little bit later um, how this approach works with, with our data and let's say a filtration uh, that depends on the crossing number. That's, that's the most natural. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, the second approach um, comes from topological data analysis. Um, it's based on the idea of Mapper, um, invented by Gunnar Carlson and his group a long time ago. And, and basically, um, here's like a little uh, schematic description of what it does. Um, so if, if what you see here in the picture is your data set that contains, of these, uh, that contains all of these black points, um, and it comes with, a, with a sort of some function um, you can you can sort of uh, get the cover with respect to this direction, and these are the sort of the gray and the and the red ones. And then you can sort of count um, sort of how many connected components you have there. And basically, as your result, you're going to get the the graph on the right. Okay, but this this map sort of comes with a with a with a function like a choice of function that's that's sort of here with the bold black and um, and of course the choice of this slice function will affect what type of graph do you get here on the right and then of course when you're interpreting your results um, you can you have to take into account the, the function that you chose which is of course a good thing and a bad thing um, or it can be a good thing and a bad thing um, but the thing that's that's really tricky with this approach is that the result um, that you get might not be stable with respect to the choice of the cover of your line. So um, in this in this talk, we're actually going to be using uh, the ball mapper um, that um, that was introduced last year by Pavel Blodko, um, who's hopefully in the audience and and can take any questions if you have any. And um, again, it's it's called ball mapper because it, it's it's built on the similar idea. Um, it's of course geometry based and it can be used as an alternative approach or it can be used together with a mapper which we'll see um, at the end of the talk. So um, it's, it's, it's slightly different. Again, what I have here is, is sort of six pictures that sort of illustrate the process uh, where you start with, um, with a point cloud. And again, if you're interested in, in getting the loops or the, or the holes or the um, in, in your data, then of course you'll be computing homology. Uh, mapper algorithms are uh, good at detecting flares, which is something that, that homology might be missing. Uh, but the idea here is that you would um, pick, um, let's say some epsilon greater than zero uh, for your radius, and then you will pick, in here in picture two, you will pick a collection of points. Those are the colorful ones, not any more black. And um, you need to find uh, this collection of points needs to satisfy some, some conditions. Um, in particular, the, the epsilon balls around these points need to provide the cover of your data set, which is shown here in the, in the third picture on the top. Um, uh, this is sometimes referred to as, a, as an epsilon net. Um, uh, sorry, it can be sort of obtained using the epsilon net or the k-means clustering or, or sort of other methods. Uh, but again, um, this this is now your cover, and and what we're kind of talking about when we're doing ball map, we we're kind of talking about the filtered narrow cover. So what we're going to be doing, uh, look, looking at here, we're going to look at all of these um, epsilon balls, and again, epsilon can change, and we're going to look at the intersection of these balls. So for example, the ball with the center, um, the red center and the purple center, they intersect. So we're going to introduce the edge here. Uh, similar for the lighter red and the green. And then you can see that uh, around the purple and the green and the um, gray point, these um, balls have not only double intersection, they actually have triple intersection. So in that sense, you can sort of create a two-dimensional cell here if you wish. Anyways, the, what you see on the last picture here is the, is the sort of result um, of the ball mapper. Okay, so... Again, this, this is an exploratory term, um, uh, tool. Um, it's um, based on the nerve complex construction. Um, it's simpler in the, in the sense that it requires only one parameter to be chosen, and that's this epsilon radius. 
Um, and uh, again, you can um, look at um, um, for more details. You can uh, I will refer you to either uh, Pavel's um, paper or to his um, uh, recording on on a YouTube um, about comparison with with the standard mapper and sort of more details on the construction. Um, and it's true that in some cases you kind of it's hard to compare the result the outputs of these two. Um, algorithms, but in some cases it does provide more accurate information. Um, but again, um, it might be actually less amenable to our interpretations because we have less choice. Anyways, um, one way or another, this is this is our um, tool um, that we've chosen to work with. Any questions? Well, actually, Radmila, I have a, a very a basic question. Uh, is any uh, intuitive definition of lens function, or is a technical definition? So, so we don't need it here. I'll be happy to talk about it. Uh, talk about it later. So, for for our approach, we're actually, um, um, refer, you know, one of the one one of the reasons why Ball Mapper is my is my tool of choice is because I don't have to make additional choices. I don't have to choose the lens function. Uh, therefore, I'm I'm hoping that I'm not introducing any additional bias. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll be happy to discuss it uh, to discuss the choice of lens function, the original mapper, after the talk. But thank you for your question. Any other questions? Okay. Because now I do want to um, persuade you uh, that nuts are big data. Um, so um, even in 1987, um, David and Ernst showed that. Um, the number of distinct knots grows exponentially with the crossing number. Um, so there's going to be a lot of them. Um, and big knot, I mean, um, big data tools have already been used on knot data. For example, Mark Hughes used the neural network approach, and then Eric Radon, together with his student um, Ward, used some data mining and deep learning methods, and then um, since I don't know how to pronounce their name, I just um, I just refer you to to uh, to this. Um, this is actually a group of physicists from University of Pennsylvania. They've addressed a very important question of um, hyperbolic volume of a knot in their work. But basically, um, again, there's about 50 different um, knot invariants, and they also have different forms. They can be um, numerical, they can be polynomial, they can be algebraic, meaning in group or or um, let's say homology theory, uh, and you know people sort of do divide them also in classical and quantum. Uh, the invariants in focus here will be the Jones, Alexander, and the Homfly PT polynomial um, as our polynomial invariants, and then um, uh, as our numerical invariants, we'll use crossing number in the signature. Um, so. Um, uh, we're next thing we're going to do. We're going to turn this data set into um, into uh, point clouds, and then we're going to apply the two um, methods that I've described um, on this data. So, um, again, where do you get the the data about knots? Well, you can either compute it yourself using the the software that's available, but the go-to, um, of course, um, resources are Rolf's and Stable, and then um, the first. 1.7 plus million knots derived by Hostet, this is by then weeks. Um, online, there's two um, amazing uh, databases, Knot Atlas maintained by Barda Khan and Knot Info maintained by uh, Cha and, and Chuck Livingston um, that you know, the whole community has contributed to. Um, more recently, uh, Benjamin Burden uh, has um, um, tabulated um, about 350 million knots under 20 crossings. And um, Adam Shikora with his student Robert Tujan, they actually used this many, and you know, I'm afraid even to start pronouncing this number, this many knot diagrams um, that are diagrams for knots up to 23 crossings uh, that they've used to confirm that um, the Jones are not conjecture for these knots. So basically, um, it's still an open question whether the Jones polynomial detects the or not, and now we know that the counterexample we have to have more than 23 crossings if it exists. Uh, in this work, we consider 
just under 10 million knots um, with up to 17 crossings. Um, so that's our big data. And um, let me sort of just quickly sort of put uh, the invariance um, that we're working with, uh, the polynomial invariance. All I want to say, I mean, I, I hope that you guys are, are familiar with these. The home plug PT polynomial is the most general two-variable polynomial that's, that can be defined using the skein relation. And then we have the Alexander polynomial and the Jones polynomial. Again, this is not the chronological order, but what's sort of important is that um, there's specializations of the home plug PT polynomial to the Alexander and the Jones polynomial. And that's, that's going to come up later. Okay, so how are we going to turn, um, how are we going to get our point cloud? So um, we're basically going to deal with coefficients of these polynomials. Um, in order to justify our choice, uh, I've, I've sort of posted some of the statements and, and there's many more that can be made. Um, you know, coefficients of the Jones polynomial do carry um, information about knots. Um, they can be used to determine the lower bound of the crossing number for alternating knots. The span of the Jones polynomial determines the crossing number. Um, sort of the outermost coefficients can provide obstruction to not being alternating. And of course, there's the volume conjecture, um, which sort of uh, relates the coefficients of the Jones polynomial with the hyperbolic volume of the knot complement. Sort of similarly, um, um, home plug PT polynomial coefficients are related to various topological properties and, and in particular the homology of branch covers. So now if we like put this all together, um, um, I hope um, you sort of agree that um, looking at the coefficients of these polynomials, is sort of it's, it's a meaningful thing to do. Um, what I want to just point out that um, out of these invariants, Alexander polynomial is the only one with a polynomial of computational complexity. Um, one thing I want to talk about now is that there's a, a fairly new um, polynomial, time polynomial invariant, a Z0 polynomial that's invented by, um, um, by um, Ronald van der Veen and Barnett Hunt that actually seems to be um, strong, very, very strong invariant. And, and also some of the coefficients of the home ply PT polynomial and some specializations can be computed in the polynomial time. But again, this data is, is sort of hard to obtain. So, so computing even these invariants is, is um, not simple for high crossing knots. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna focus on um, uh, knot data uh, that's based on the Jones polynomial. So um, what I'm going to um, look at is um, uh, to illustrate how we do it, I'm going to look at uh, Jones polynomials for knots up to um, six crossings, and they're shown here on the screen. Uh, the idea is um, that a Jones polynomial is a Laurent polynomial. As you can see here, I'm using the variable Q. Um, so I want to get a vector out of these coefficients. So um, one choice we made that's, that's um, you know, maybe not the best choice, and we're working on it. But we will. Uh, we did mirror the Jones polynomial so that the extreme power is positive, and in turn, that actually forces the signature to be positive. So um, here's um, here's where we use the mirrors. And then um, additionally, we d we did center all of these um, vectors so that um, the free term is always in the same position for every vector. So basically, if you look at um, look at this table here, this is this is how our um, data looks like. Okay, so now that we have our point cloud, um, I'm going to use the first approach, um, uh, and it, it has been done for again, as I've said, knots up to 17 crossings, and it turns out although this 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 uh, picture I guess doesn't doesn't do it justice. Uh, but it turns out that the PCA reduces the dimension of this 35-dimensional um, data set, right, because we're looking at knots up to 17 crossings, um, into three dimensions. And I want to point out something is that, uh, that um, the color here actually corresponds to um, different values of signature of those knots. Okay, so... Um, here are the numbers and, and the graphs that are um, 
sort of supporting the, the three-dimensionality uh, of the data. Um, again, I, I won't go over it. Uh, this paper is available on archive and it will soon be published. Um, um, yeah, so I think three dimensions, that, now I forget the number, I think three dimensions sort of um, go up to 0 0.98. Uh, but but the idea here that um, uh, we actually need to look again, as I said, we need to look at the at the stability of of these results. Um, so um, across various filtrations. So I'm I'm going to talk about it in a moment. But basically, as I as I said at the very beginning, um, if you if you want to really think about all knots um, and and sort of determine its shape or say something about the shape or the structure. You know, you can always sort of say, well, maybe I'll use, you know, um, manifold learning techniques, but we don't really know what the underlying structure of this data set would be. The full set data set, of course, lives in, in infinite dimensional space and it's of infinite size. So we're sort of hoping that this filtration will, will help with extrapolating um, conclusions. And we actually looked at two different filtrations, norm filtration um, that actually has some issues and it turns out that the crossing filtration is actually very consistent with um, with what we're doing. Uh, but then in addition to this, we, we actually wanted to um, um, to look at special families of knots and how um, this method would apply to these special families. Um, of course, the step that's, that's missing is, is sort of doing um, um, some sampling, of course, or maybe um, using randomly created knots. But anyway, the, the, the conclusion for now here is that um, uh, if you're looking at the uh, persistent PCA, uh, the filtration with respect to crossing number is, is sort of remarkably stable. And again, all details are in the, in the paper. If there's any variance, um, it comes from less significant principal components. And the first principal component is basically stable across the filtration from 12 crossings to 17 crossings. So, but here's what happens with the um, uh, twist link knots. Okay, if you look at this data, um, we actually have um, about 500,000 knots, um, and this is the shape that we get. And the question is, well. Um, you know, what's the dimension of this space? And, and if you sort of look at the numbers and so on and so on, it turns out that um, this should not be a, a 5,003 dimensional space, um, which is the, the dimension of our data. Um, it turns out that um, I think four principal components um, account for um, 0 0.96 variance. So it should be four dimensional space, but again, notice that the space of all knots is three-dimensional. So again, there's, there's sort of issues here. And, and this is even more uh, apparent if you actually look at the torus knots. So again, this is the result of the uh, persistent PCA, the, the picture here on the top. And what it sort of suggests that if you look at uh, torus knots up to 2,000 crossings, um, um, what you get is that the space should be 25-dimensional if you want to count for at least 0.95%. Uh, uh, but if you, you actually need, I think, 224 directions to, to get to 0 0.99. So again, I, I hope that this is sort of a good illustration that we have to be very, very careful um, if we're going to sort of do any sort of sampling uh, or anything here because the, um, well, th there's issues with sampling this data. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, Ramil, I've got a question. What are those double twist link knots? What are those? Um, let me let me keep that for for the end of the 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 talk. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So um, here are the pictures um, that will hopefully persuade you of, of what I've sort of said. This is the explained variance plotted uh, against the crossing filtration and the stability of the principal components on the right. 
And again, the blue one is the first principal component, and it's um, it's it's basically just remarkably stable across the the filtration. However, if you look at the filtration by norm, um, you sort of see that things are sort of all over the place. Um, okay, so sorry. Also here, if you look at the uh, the the and the stability here, like the, the variation that comes from, from the other component is kind of like um, presumed or, or um, dampened by the stability of the first one. So with the norm filtration, um, it's, it was very disappointing, right? So you could sort of see that things are all over the place. So the first principal component um, is sort of like, um, it's okay, but, but again, there's there's no stability for for you know the second and the and the um, third one. So what this is sort of telling us, and what this what we think is is um, the reason for this instability, is the um, that the norm distribution of, of the of the Jones vector um, is actually heavily dependent on the type of knot that you have. So what you have here is the norm distribution of the L2 norms, just of these vectors, for all knots um, shown in gray, um, just alternating knots shown in green, and then this purple blue um, color represents the uh, non-alternating knots. So basically, if you if you look at it, and again, this is the 12 crossing, 30 crossing, 14 crossing, and all the way to um, um, is there six of them? Yeah, 17 crossings. Um, you can sort of see that um, the, the distribution of norms for the whole data set, uh, once we start having more non alternating knots, sort of skews more towards the smaller values. Um, so as we're adding more and more knots, and you can sort of think that, um, you know, moving from like, I don't know, 15 to 16 crossings, basically it's not like a small change, it's basically doubles the size of the data. Um, this is what's sort of happening, right? So the norm filtration sort of cannot be um, reliably used in this case. Okay, we can do the same thing for the Alexander data. And um, again, this is the picture that we get. And uh, the takeaway here is that the Alexander point cloud is, is approximately one dimensional. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here and uh, with, the, with the persistent PCA um, again and, and move to the uh, ball mapper approach. One thing that I want to comment is again that here the color also um, comes from um, signature. Um, so sort of just have in mind, let's sort of compare this one with, um, with the picture that we had for um, for the Jones polynomial, where it seems that there are these flares that are monochromatic when it comes to signature, which is definitely not a pattern that we can observe for the Alexander data. Okay, so this was one approach, and again, there's there's many um, other ways in which um, the dimension of your data set can be determined. Um, so that's something that lies in the future, but let's sort of see. Um, what, whether we can get any different uh, information or, or better information from um, a ball mapper. So when you consider the same data set obtained um, by vectorizing the Jones polynomials, um, this is the ball mapper um, graph that you get. Um, and this is the ball mapper graph that's colored by the crossing number. Okay, so here we're actually using the data um, for knots up to 15 crossings. And um, again, um, if each one of these nodes um, represents a certain number of knots, if there is an edge between the two nodes, that sort of means that uh, ball mapper found that their Jones vectors are somehow close by, that they're somehow similar. So what you sort of see here is that the smaller crossing numbers are here towards the center, if you wish, of this graph, and then the higher crossing knots are towards the, the ends or these flares. 
that actually, you know, to me look kind of very similar to the to the PCA results, filter PCA results um, that we obtained. Um, but I, sort of like I have to kind of put like a little disclaimer here. It, it's sort of somewhat disappointing, right? So um, again, the size of the nodes represents the size of the cluster. If you're actually working with the software, you can get the exact number of elements in each cluster and the and the identifiers for all of the nodes that are in a particular cluster. But again, the clusters here in the center are larger. Um, and also there's like a mixture of high crossing and low crossing knots. Um, I actually don't think that we have a coloring by norm. Oh no, we do, right? And, and you can also sort of see that this center is described by knots whose, um, whose Jones vectors have smaller norm. So here it's roughly 30 and then in the flares, their norm is about 600. Okay, so what else can we sort of look at? We can sort of um, see whether whether the bow mapper results can support the, the interpretation uh, from uh, the filter PCA that sort of like there's this mixture of alternating and non-alternating based on the norm. And indeed, now we can color, if you wish, um, this um, bow mapper graph by the property whether the knots or what's the percentage of the knots in, in each cluster that's alternating versus non-alternating. And what you will get is that these clusters that are in the flares contain only high crossing alternating knots, while there's a, there's a mixture of alternating and non-alternating knots um, in the center of the, of the bold mapper graph. So um, let's sort of um, look at the space of uh, the Jones polynomials for just alternating knots and the space of knot polynomials for non-alternating, just non-alternating knots up to um, 15 crossings. So one is shown here on the left and one is shown here on the right. And, um, you know, what are the conclusions? Well, the, the Jones polynomial data for alternating knots is sort of like much cleaner. Again, the color here comes from um, signature and um, you can, the numbers actually represent that all of the knots here in, in this layer have signature two. Everything that's green has signature six. Um, the blue one is eight, zero, and four. And then you can sort of see that, that um, the non-alternating knots have sort of more complicated structure. And, and I guess you could sort of fit this part here in the middle of, of this graph. Okay, um, so any questions so far? That I will answer now and not later, anyways. So, um, uh, here's um, here's the same thing done for just the torus knots that I've described before. Um, and again, um, it, it's somewhat cleaner, colored by the data. You can sort of see that the norm sort of grows um, a lot. Um, if you color by the number of crossings, of course, you have the higher crossing numbers here in flares. But you can kind of sort of see that there's like a similar number of flares. Okay, so alternating, um, there's, um, there, there's not just alternating. Not Yes. yes. Right. So there was a question. Um, so let's sort of focus now on the signature. If you look at um, the this is this is the ball mapper uh, for knots up to 17 crossings colored by signature, and you can sort of see that there's these flares that are where the signature is. Um, and they're monochromatic, and then there's the messy core. And of course, our idea was to sort of um, re recall and sort of remember the Garofalidis conjecture. Um, that's of course only conjecture for, for so-called simple knots, um, and those are knots whose um, roots of the Alexander polynomial are, um, that are unital, have multiplicity one. Um, and this, this conjecture was, an, uh, could be, it was proven for all knots up to eight crossings, and it sort of says that the color Jones polynomial determines the signature of these knots, of these simple knots. So um, it, it's conjecture to be true in, in, um, in, um, like in general, but here's what we sort of went after uh, based on sort of these flares here. We sort of looked um, into, into knots and, and tried to sort of see um, how much does the Jones polynomial know about signature, okay? 
And um, again, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have time, but we found like a, a range of counterexamples. So counterexample are knots that um, have the same Jones polynomial, but different signature. Um, and for example, they can be very small. Um, so, you know, these two knots have signatures, zero, identical Jones polynomials, but signatures zero and four. And you can sort of see when I say small, I say that they have small, small norm of the Jones polynomial. There can be multiple ones, and there can actually be multiple ones with the same number of crossings. Um, so some of we have counterexample even within the same number of crossings, and actually they can both be alternating. So there's 12 crossing alternating knots with the same Jones polynomial, um, but a different signatures. And the ones that are in um, bold, like 13 non-alternating knot, 627 and 716, that, that's actually remarkable, but because they have most of the invariants that we're kind of looking at um, the same, yet um, they are different knots. Okay, and they have different signature. Okay, so um, yeah, so the Jones polynomial will not um, sort of help us um, determine the signature for um, many knots, but again, here are the plots. This is the 14 crossing data, this is the 15, 16, and 70 crossing data. So this is our cross infiltration. And again, there are slightly different embeddings of bold mapper graphs, but I hope that you can sort of see the stability of, of this structure that appears. Um, but then you can kind of look at it and sort of see that the 2, 6, and 10 are on one side, and then the 0, 8, and 4 are on the other side, if you wish, of the graph, which sort of tells us that, um, um, well, uh, let's sort of look at the at the at the very bottom of this slide that the four core results um, that's attributed to actually many many people um, and um, I found it written in the in the uh, Trachik-Shintitsky paper that the Jones that both the Jones polynomial and the Alexander polynomial determine the signature mod four. Um, so um, basically, this is what we can show if we color these graphs by by signature mod four we sort of see the, the sort of clear separation. So why would we want to um, sort of do that? Why would this be interesting, for example, for me as someone who specializes in Havana homology is because there's a big class of knots um, that doesn't have a complete characterization. There's a so-called Havana thin knots. Uh, those are knots whose Havana homology is supported on two diagonals. And all of the entries or the homology entries are determined by the Jones polynomial, and then the signature sort of tells you where these two diagonals lie in the in the two-dimensional space of Havana homology. Um, and we know that these knots include the alternating quasi-alternating knots. So um, if we could determine um, uh, for which knots the Jones polynomial determines or knows about signature, then that they will give us example of um, of um, when the Jones polynomial actually determines Humano homology, and um, it will be interesting to know uh, whether those have to be thin or not. Okay, so um, uh, let's sort of, let me just, um, so I'm sorry, do I have 15 minutes or an hour? I'd say you've got an hour, so I'll speak for Carlos. <laughs> okay, I'll probably I'll probably finish somewhere in between 50 and an hour. So um, I'm going to now use the same ball mapper technique on the on the data obtained from the Alexander polynomial um, uh, in the in the same way uh, as we did with the Jones polynomial, except that you know, there's no mirroring issues. So um, I recall that the persistent PCA did give us the that the Alexander um, uh, polynomial data should be one dimensional, and somehow that's reflected. Uh, again, this is not a theorem. This is reflected in the structure of the ball mapper graph that looks very linear. Uh, we can color it by the crossing number. Once we do that, we sort of see that there's there's a core or the center of the ball mapper graph that has um, a mixture of high crossing and low crossing knots and then the sort of flares um, contain the high crossing numbers and um, knots with the higher norm where the lower norm is in the center. And then also um, the sort of these two flares in this in this case sort of contain only alternating knots and then there's a mixture of alternating and not alternating in the center. Okay, what about signature? 
well, again, we, we get a confirmation of the of the data of the kind of um, coloring that we used on the on the results obtained by the PCA. That there is sort of um, similar to the to the fact that the dimension reduction obtained by the PCA when colored by not signature doesn't sort of reveal any patterns. Um, the ball mapper graph sort of just contains a mixture of signatures all over the place. So unlike the the beautiful structure that we get in the JOS polynomial. However, if we do color it um, by signature module of four, um, we sort of do get that um, there's this dichotomy that's sort of like one flare um, contains all knots uh, whose uh, signature is um, two modulo four and the other ones is sort of divisible by four and then there's some um, mixture here in the middle. Okay, so um, Likewise, sir, we can we can do it again. The ball mapper is a very versatile tool, and you know, we can we can play with your data. Um, this is alternating knots um, colored by just alternating knots colored by signature. This is alternating knots colored by norm, um, um, and and this is non-alternating knots colored by uh, just signature and by norm. I apologize for the typo. And here's here's the the two variable polynomial. Okay. Um, and the data that we get um, is um, extremely messy. <laughs> okay, so this is the complete PT data for 15 crossing knots colored by signature and colored by signature mod four. And it sort of shows that there's um, a long way that we have to, have to go to sort of figure things out. Okay, but one thing that we can do is we can um, use the ball mapper to actually compare these data sets. Um, and again, the way that our data is structured is, that structured is that we have a knot, and then for each knot, we have these three separate point clouds. But again, the, if you wish, the, the database of knots provides the indexing set for, for these other point clouds. So what we can do, we can compare, or we can uh, compare the structure of the ball mapper graphs uh, let's say from the Alexander to the Jones by sort of like pulling certain clusters from the Alexander data all the way to the Jones data through the common set of knots. And this is what um, we do here. Again, this can be done sort of um, in the interactive setting. You can just hover over the, over the cluster and sort of see which knots are in there. But what you can see here is that if we label this central node and sort of pull it back, it will roughly um, map here, but it will sort of map to, to many different clusters in the, in the, in the Jones data set. Um, again, we can sort of see that this flare correspond to all of the things on, on uh, one side of the ball mapper graph and sort of likewise for this one. Um, and then we can do the similar thing for the Alexander and, and home flight PT data. But again, the, the transformation between coefficients is sort of highly nonlinear, and there's no uh, pretty picture that we can obtain here. So it's somewhat disappointing. What this means is that sort of like these, these nodes that are colored sort of um, here, this sort of just gets spread all over these data set. I guess the coloring is kind of hard to do. So um, in order to compare um, these guys, um, okay, this is, this is um, the, there's the comparison between the Jones and the home flight PT. Okay, we sort of says that the, again, the core of the Jones data sort of gets sent sort of everywhere here. Okay, and then this player here. So we were thinking and, and trying to, to figure out um, how, to, how to do these comparisons in a better way. And what we sort of did, we sort of went back to the conventional mapper um, and um, sort of um, try to sort of um, make it work together with the ball mapper. Um, and, and here's what, what the idea was. Okay, so I'm looking at the ball mapper graph for the Alexander data, I'm looking at the ball mapper graph for the, for the Jones data. And then to, to go back to, to Renzo's function, to Renzo's question uh, about the lens function, so we know that, um, that the specializing variables of the home flight PT polynomial to one and the square root of T minus one over square root of T gives us the Alexander polynomial and there's a similar one for the Jones polynomial. So we can actually use this as our lens function uh, to get a sort of a, a covering map of the, of the Jones data 
or Alexander data from the home flight PT, or it can sort of um, be used to get a fiber, right? If we pick uh, a cluster here, we can sort of pull it back to the home flight PT data and sort of see what we get. And this is the last thing that I'm going to show to you. Um, again, this is um, the pullback um, um, uh, of the Jones data um, to the home fly PT data. And again, this was obtained by using the standard mapper on a ball mapper results. And again, I do not know what the what the implications of, of this result uh, is, but but basically you can sort of see this, and I don't know how we can measure the, the similarity between the the Jones graph and the and the home fly PT graph obtained by the pullback. Uh, Okay, so but but again, they they, they are they, they look very very similar, and there, it seems like there's sort of nothing new here. Um, however, when you pull back the Alexander data, um, and again, this is the on what you see on the right is is a zoomed in version. Um, um, it, it's sort of interesting because you can sort of see that this. Structure and again, everything is colored by signature. I did not emphasize that. The, the, the structure here that sort of doesn't show any apparent patterns on the signature, when pulled back to the home fly PT data, um, actually starts sort of seeing um, the different clusters that that are monochromatic with respect to coloring by signature. So um, that's promising. So in a summary, um, uh, what I've um, hope convinced you of that these somewhat, I mean. Uh, Techniques of like different origins and different approaches, they, they provide the uh, similar results. So both results are stable under the crossing number filtration, and they serve sort of, um, these, these shapes sort of appear to have similar uh, structural properties on, on both Jones and Alexander data. And um, again, they give us plenty of tools for analyzing, comparing these and, and other not invariants. So what comes next is to, of course, formalize and 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 quantify these these operate um, these um, results, um, and of course, next step is to um, look at um, Havana cohomology, uh, where this sort of um, covering map or the pullback should be um, even more interesting between the Jones uh, polynomial data and Havana cohomology. And the uh, numerical invariant that's obtained from Havana homology is called the Rasmussen's S invariant um, because it's sort of known uh, to be equal to signature um, for many knots, but um, there's a lot of um, differences when it comes to higher crossing knots. And of course, both the signature and the Rasmussen S invariant are related to um, maybe the holy grail of problems in, in knot theory, which is the unknotting number. So I'll stop here. I'll, I want to thank all of my collaborators, Paolo Lotka and Davide Gunari, who are, I think, in the audience, and Mustafa Hajij and Jesse Levitz, with whom I worked with um, on the persistent PCA approach, and of course, these various foundations for their uh, generous support uh, and for making these collaborations and computations possible. And um, I'll thank Davide for the last slide that's asking about questions. Comments. Let's stop here. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Oh, uh, yeah, I, is, is there any, any information in your data about uh, the bridge number of a knot? The bridge number of a knot, and maybe same question for the genus of a knot. In fact, I don't. I don't even know if, if, if there's an algorithm uh, not to speak an effective algorithm to compute the bridge number of a knot. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we our data did not contain uh, did not contain this these values again. This is just a preliminary um, preliminary. <laughs> Adventure into, into using these methods uh, with the hope of, um, of of getting these results. I mean, again, there's 
there's theoretical results that that uh, relate bridge numbers and, and genus have a nod to various other invariants. So I'm, I'm hoping that once we look at the more complete data set and, and, and sort of then focus on particular relationships, I'll, I might be able to answer your question, but but not at the moment. So, Raymond, I had a question about those ball mapper pictures. In those pictures, the non-alternating knots are sort of down in the middle, and the spikes are all alternating knots. Of course, now if you stratify by crossing number, non-alternating knots are going to take over. There are a lot more of them than there are of alternating knots. So do you think that that will be the same, that even in very high crossing number, that the spikes will always be alternating? Uh, that's an excellent question, but that's again a statistical result and the one that I don't know how to answer because I actually do not know um, uh, what the, um, okay, so let's, let's step back. So the data that we do know um, is, and again, you can, you can sort of see it here. Um, again, what you see here is the number of, what is it? Here's the norm, I think, and here's the number of knots. Um, and or the other way around, I forget now. But anyways, the idea the idea is that the that's right, the the sort of like of course non alternating knots have have smaller norm than the alternating ones. They also have a smaller span, right? We always know that for alternating knots, the full span is 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 realized. Um, but Okay, all I can say at this moment then is, is the following, that, uh, that basically if you look at, okay, sorry, ball mapper, wrong um, thing. So let's look at, yeah. So if you look at, let's say just the Jones data, you can sort of see that the picture is much cleaner for the alternating knots versus non-alternating knots. So I'm sort of thinking that the results that we can get as, as kind of often the case in knot theory will be, cleaner or easier to obtain for alternating knots and probably less interesting <laughs> while it's going to be much harder to to analyze the complicated structure of non-alternating knots. But non-alternating knots, of course, will, will, will take over. So I think the best we could do at the moment is sort of just to um, analyze non-alternating knots sort of separately from alternating in the data that we had. I hope that this somewhat answers your question. But I don't have the numbers or the trends that, that are um, uh, that appear with these, but I I, I do believe that non alternating knots will, will take over. A, a question: uh, I I would imagine that all the tables that you are considering, even though uh, all those up to twenty three crossings are about prime knots. Am I correct? Prime knots. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, yes, I'm not considering that that's, that's an excellent point. Yes, I'm not considering, we're only considering knots up to 17 crossings, uh, but yes, these are only prime knots. Um, so yes, um, um, Jason Cantarella and his group are, are in our future, both in terms of um, um, looking at random knots and, and looking at non-prime knots. Yes, you're absolutely right. So uh, I have a question on the uh, asymptotic behavior of your set of points as well. Uh, I'm sorry, these questions are very hard, but I think it's mostly um, unknown which polynomials can be realized by a joint polynomial. But uh, can you start to get some kind of answers here where, I don't know, you would be, I mean, you, fo uh, you fix the radius of uh, the balls maybe, and um, would you, uh, Asymptotically get something connected, maybe, or would you get um, vectors that are further and further away, accelerating? Uh, um, or, uh, I mean, do you have any idea of the asymptotic shape of your uh, point cloud? Okay, so um, I think it's an excellent question. However, I'm not sure that I've completely understood it. So let's let's sort of. Um, Maybe let me try to answer it. So um, we did not look at um, the realization um, question, but what I can tell you is that if you're looking at a kind of norm, um, the, the kind of center of the point cloud is going to be getting filled in by higher crossing non-alternating knots. So with this approach, that question is actually 
uh, a meaningful question to ask, but I think it would be hard to to answer, right? Because somehow we're always going to get this higher crossing non alternating knot that are going to be filling in the small, like if you fix the radius of the ball, like in the center, either by norm or, or something, I guess norm is the one. Again, it's it's back to that same picture, like the 17 crossing data will, that once you increase from n to n plus one, they're going to be n plus one crossing nodes that are going to be filling in the existent things in there. All right. So, so you, ex you expect a big blog with no holes, let's say, I mean, sort of, but then like, like empty, empty part of space somewhere. Correct, I mean, do you have correct. an idea of, yeah, all right. Okay. I, I don't know how dense it is going to be, the blob in the middle, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not using this in, in a precise topological like terms, but yes, we, we basically have that, um, so I, I think David is here, I'm forgetting the numbers, but um, the center is like extremely heavy. Uh, I think for, um, I think for the home flight PT data, um, okay, if David is here, he should help me out with the numbers, but I think for, for home flight PT data, it contains more than half. Let's maybe let's maybe maybe say that out of three hundred plus thousand knots, it contains like more than two hundred for the home flight PT data. Like this this center here is very heavy. All right, yeah, but, but again, Actually, the home flight PT very extreme. The similar is true for the Jones data too, and the and the, right. So that's a beautiful question. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, these these nodes here are much much larger than the the ones in the flares. All right. And the other way around, you could maybe find uh, like infinitely large places in space that are going to be empty, or at least conjecture that they will. Well, I mean, so this is an abstract graph, right? Mm -hmm. So this yeah. graph doesn't doesn't sort of live um, in in that high dimensional space. Um, so I I would not be making conjecture, but it's not an unreasonable thing to to um to expect yes okay well thanks <laughs> sorry i could not give a better answer can i ask a question of course i enjoyed the talk radmila i wish to ask you uh, suppose that you consider those data for knots up to 10 crossings, say, and you do the PCA. Uh, how predictive would be these principal directions for the PCAs of the full data set that you consider okay. up to 15 crossings? Well, um, uh, very predictive. Okay, I did not start with 10, uh, but I started, this is the picture that I, I, I should have emphasized more that I hope answers your question, right? So. This is the princi first principal component. This is the second principal component, the third and so on, right? Here's the, the, the agenda. And, and basically what this, these pictures sort of tell me is that, that um, um, they're just remarkably stable across the filtration, right? So this here is the filtration. So, so this is how it looks like for, for the, um, this is the explained variance for the, for the, um, 11 crossing, 12 crossing, 13 crossing, 14 crossing. And then what you sort of see here um, is the, um, this is the angle measured in radians. So this sort of tells you how much it changes. So the first principal component basically is stable across the filtration. The sixth one changes, right? And then they're mm -hmm. like somewhat stable here. So I hope uh, there, again, there's more details in the paper, but I hope that this is this answers your question. Actually, thank you. It does. Yeah, thank so, you. So, so that's that's like one of the one of the good things that I sort of like really really like about this approach. Again, uh, when using it uh, with different data, I think you know one one should check the stability both of the centers and the and the and the angles of the things. But yes, thanks. One question by Kenneth Millet, Radmila. Hi, Ken. For, mm -hmm. Okay. For a fixed number of crossings, does your analysis show alternating knots are more complex than non-alternated knots? 
um, uh, what does he what does he mean more complex, right? So um, uh, let me go back to ball mapper. I would I would actually say the opposite. But again, this is this is my personal opinion. That's maybe not um, supported by <laughs> by opinions of my collaborators. So um, uh, to answer Ken's question, I, I think I would go back to this picture. Uh, again, this is the Jones data up to 15 crossings just of alternating knots. And this is just of non-alternating knots up to 15 crossings. But again, the, the similar kind of, um, the similar is true for any crossing number up to 17. Uh, right, so, so if you wish, this is, Again, Ken, if, you, if you're here, can, if you can clarify what you mean by complexity, uh, I would appreciate that. But um, I, I think using these methods, um, again, that the alternating notes will be more approachable in the sense that um, what well, a good way of saying it. Again, uh, so, yeah. so Rod Miller, is, this is sort of like a um, uh, maybe not an ill-informed uh, uh, question, but for example, with the Jones polynomial, you know that the spread of the Jones polynomial uh, equals the number of crossings for alternating knots, <clears throat> but can be significantly less for non-alternating knots. So perhaps that's maybe one indication that alternating knots are more complex in the sense that it has more complex polynomials. And okay. I think there there are other other uh, manifestations of that, uh, and so that's why I was asking the question: if one compared, you know, uh, the same kind of measures side by side, if one would see somehow that the alternating knots, even though they are rarer as the number of crossings get large, or as a family, somehow more complex than the behavior, maybe the average behavior of the non-alternating knots. Absolutely, absolutely. Now that I understand the question, I, I absolutely agree. That's like a fantastic observation. Yes, so so they're more complex, but when I when I sort of wanted to say that they, they are simpler is, is that the, we get a cleaner structure right. using these methods. But again, that might be the artifact of, uh, the, the consequence of, of the fact that they're, that there's, um, a greater variety and get greater complexity in their polynomials. So you get a cleaner structure while there's more clustering um, among the non-alternating knots. Mm -hmm. uh, one, while I have you, uh, would it be possible to share with this audience the reference to which you keep referring? Uh, yes, yes, by all means. It's a paper that's posted in the archive and it's about to appear. Uh, it contains only the PCA results. Mm -hmm. Um, I promise to have uh, the ball mapper results out soon. Okay. And again, I, I cannot thank enough to, um, to Pavel and, and, and David for, I think in the audience, if um, people have, if, if, if someone um, uh, wants the ball mapper with all these wonderful tools that, that sort of can be used um, um, as here, sorry, as uh, here, to sort of like play with these because you can you can sort of like pick them you can even pick like a cluster that contains a particular knot in one data set and sort of see which cluster it belongs or which cluster it's close to on the other side so i hope i mean i don't know how we're going how successful we're going to be but I'm, I'm very um very curious to see with the larger data set with like more invariants uh whether it would be um feasible to sort of um, get better characterizations of these clusters and better understanding, um, let's say, even of these fibers that are obtained by pulling the Jones data into Alexander, into Homeflight PT or the Alexander data in Homeflight PT. Yeah. Because actually, this is a question for Ken, I guess this is not the standard thing, but, but sort of like uh, one thing that I would like to know, and again, one thing that's missing in this token, I apologize, I don't have it, is, is the PCA on the Homeflight PT data. Again, there's an additional, um, complexity requirement here uh, that if people have any ideas, I'll be happy to hear it. What we did here, we just sort of like flattened the two-dimensional um, structure of the Homeflight PT polynomial to one-dimensional, and it would be fantastic if we had like a, a meaningful and, and smarter way to do that. Uh, but again, I'm curious to sort of see Alexander and Jones data are contained in the, in the, in the Homeflight PT data, so 
how are they embedded? <laughs> and what's what's the structure? Yeah. Look, great, great talk. Yes. Um, I think I have some ideas about complexity, but I'm still trying to meditate on them, and maybe one day I'll share them. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, if there are no other questions, then Radmila, thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you.